Well, you should be seeing Catskill Regional Ag Conference. Yes, we're seeing your uh, presentation and we hear you quite clearly. Oh, good. Okay, as, as Rich mentioned, I am with uh, Pro Dairy. My official title is Farm Strategic Planning Specialist, which I almost need a CDL to carry that title. Uh, but I work uh, a lot of times one-on-one -on -one with the farms, as Rich mentioned. And we talk about uh, agricultural structures and ventilation, uh, anything that has to do with farmstead planning or uh, some of the CAFO planning uh, with uh, you know, manure storages, bunker silos, uh, which typically of the larger farms, but I also do a lot with smaller farms as well. Uh, so today we're gonna be looking at uh, if we have an older, uh, facility, what can we do with it? So, you know, you've just purchased or maybe placed some old, purchased a place with some old barns, maybe just moved out of your, uh, out of your operation of an older building into newer or up-to-date facilities. So now what? Well, we can raise it. You know, has it outlived its useful life? Is it time just to salvage what we can and uh, put it to rest? You know, if so, then some of the uh, options you have, of course, yeah, take it down. But there's also companies out there, and this is a, an example of one, Strong Oaks Woodshop. They take a lot of the lumber from these older barns and turn it into uh, various pieces of uh, furniture and bar stools, bedroom sets, so on and so forth. I have not worked with these guys and I don't know if they actually buy the barn or what, but even if they just take it down and get it out of there, again, that's worth something in itself. You know, could we remodel it with a little tweaking? Can it be part of another facet of the enterprise or even entirely different enterprise? Can we retrofit it? In other words, update it and upgrade it so it can be part of an expanded enterprise or maybe even a new enterprise. Just remember though, if any of these options is greater than 50% of a new structure, think long and hard before you act. Um, a lot of times we tend to overestimate the value of the old building. We underestimate you know, what it's gonna take to actually do the remodel or the retrofit. And then even after doing all that, remember you still have an older facility and there's a cost to the late long-term inefficiencies of those buildings. So that 50% is kind of a ballpark figure, but it gives you something to work with. You know, look at the uh, foundation as well. You know, are there cracks settling and shifting? You know, a minor crack following a mortar joint, that's probably okay. Vertical crack through the mortar and the block or stones could mean trouble. And it could be differential settling or shifting of the foundation. Remember, a lot of these old barns, the stones were originally laid on earth footing, excavated, or at least they hoped, below frost line. So there's no continuous reinforced concrete footer like we use now. Is the mortar loose? You know, it might just need repointing. Just clean out the joint real well and put the new mortar in. Now here, the type of, of mortar can be important. A typical Portland mortar may be too hard, so you may wanna look for a sand mix. And then of course, there's always spalling, or this is the blistering or sloughing of concrete or plaster coats. And it's usually an indicator of hydraulic pressure from the outside. Now, quite often we can deal with this, you know, with proper drainage of surface and subsurface water, and that takes care of it. You know, what's on the outside? You know, what's the condition of the roof covering and flashing? Now, a good 35 year architectural shingle really only lasts about 25 years in our climate. And multiple layers actually will require replacing sooner. So there's no advantage to not doing a complete tear off before you put new shingles on. Slate lasts forever as long as the nails stay good. Cedar shakes may just need some waterproofing. And steel and aluminum may last 50 years as long as the fasteners are tight. Just remember, aluminum likes to expand and contract a lot, and therefore the holes around the fasteners tend to become larger. So you may want to check those. You now check the flashing in the valleys and along shed roofs, cupolas, and chimneys. 
and evaluate the roof from the inside as well. You know, look for water stains and mold, you know, stachybotrys or black mold is something that can be really nasty and exposure could lead to mycotoxicosis, which is definitely something that's very nasty for yourself or for the animals. Look for rotted sheathing and rusted metal plates because that could mean the roof is already structurally compromised. How about the walls, are they straight? Check at the eave level, see if you can see a curve in the eaves. You know, a sagging roof line may be an in indicator of bigger problems. You know, if the walls have sagged and pulled out, you know, the floor joists and rafters may only be sitting on about a fingernail width bearing surface. So if the foundation's okay, you may just need to uh, clean out the chaff, the dirt, the animal dander, et cetera, and pull the building back together with heavy cable or turnbuckles. And you may need a portable air compressor and a shop vac in order to do that job well. And I'd suggest quite often maybe two cables, one going laterally and another going diagonally so you can get things plumb and square again. And how about the gutter in interior? We're looking at gutters and drains. You know, where do they need to drain to? You know, will they need to be filled in? You know, will the EPA or DEC have a fit if you don't? You know, are things draining to the road ditch? You don't want things to head there. And how about the floors? You know, will they need to be resurfaced or replaced? You know, will the ceiling need to be airtight for whatever you're doing? And how about the free span? Any in any of the interior supporting structures need to be replaced or removed? And is it big enough to accommodate uh, the equipment that you're going to be using in there? And is there any reason for grade A requirements? You know, will you need to meet those and can it be done without a monumental effort? How about the location it's in? You know, if it's topography. If it's in a hole or near a water curse, water body, you may want to think twice about it. Quite often these older buildings were built close to the water, again, as a source of water, so you didn't have to be trucking it too far. How about the access to and from other buildings and from the farmyard? Pickup and delivery, you know, anything that's brought in or, or unloaded, how about products that are loaded and hauled away? You know, can you or do you need to get six wheelers, 10 wheelers, or even semis in and out? Uh, how about gooseneck trailers? You know, and can you expand this structure? You know, is it in the way of expanding other facilities or is farm lanes standing so close you can't do anything? And how about is it environmentally friendly? You know, when you get through remediating some of these things, it might have been more cost effective to have built elsewhere. And how about the building size? You know, is it big enough for its intended purposes? If not, can it be expanded? Can you go up? Can you go out? Can you go longer? You know, is there room to install any equipment that you need? Any cages or fences, gates, whatever? And are there adequate clearances to the walls, ceiling, support columns? You know, a lot of times these older buildings, they just don't have enough headroom in order to get new equipment in there. And how about doorways? Are they large enough? You know, are they big enough or can they be made big enough to get your equipment or product being the livestock in and out? Remember, you're going to probably want to have skid loaders and whatnot to move things in, clean things out. Are they conveniently located so you can get in and out without a great deal of difficulty? And if they need to be moved, how hard will it be to move them? You know, will there be significant restructuring required to upgrade them? Just remember on these older facilities, you know, if you take structure out, you have to replace it with some other structure somewhere in order to carry the load. And is the barn airtight and insulated or doesn't even need to be? If there is insulation in there, what's the condition? You know, if it's full of vermin, feces and urine, or if it's rain soaked, you're gonna to wanna to get that out of there. And how about the heating and ventilation? Now, quite often with livestock enterprises, we don't have to worry about heating, but we do need to worry about ventilation. You know, is it adequate? Is it even functioning? Um, are we going to need some sort of cooling system in there as well? 
And how about the utilities? Well, what is the condition of the plumbing and wiring? You know, will it need to be upgraded for the needs we have? How about is the water supply sufficient? You know, you want to shoot for a minimum of five gallons per minute, but if you have rust and hard water in the galvanized pipes, like this example here, how much are you getting through there? And to replace it, of course, you have you can choose between galvanized, copper, HDPE, PVC, and PEX. Um, each of those has pros and cons and is better in some applications than others. Uh, but just remember, if it's going to be anywhere near an outside wall or be outside, you're going to need to insulate or bury these water lines. How about the natural gas or propane supply lines? Are they sound and up to code? Last thing you need is a gas leak. And how about the electrical entrance? Will it handle peak draws? You know, if you have several fans or some other thing, heavy load coming in, uh, is it going to be able to handle it without heating or overheating? You know, is it the old knob and tube? You know, and is that panel properly sized and properly grounded? And are there enough electrical ground rods outside? Can efficient feeding, watering, and manure handling systems be installed if necessary? And again, there's nothing to be gained trading one labor intensive facility for another. So labor efficiency is a factor in these things. And how about fire safety? You want outlets. Now I'll clean the cobwebs away from them. Check the phase on the outlets. Each one should be proper hot, proper neutral, proper ground. Number of times I've seen this where the neutral and the hot lead have been switched. Look at also the fans, you know, are they clean and operational? How about light fixtures? Um, you kind of want these explosion proof fixtures in there. Remember, extension cords are temporary, you know, but still they need to be fully grounded and have a proper gauge. I have seen where heaters have been plugged in and the cord was too light. The cord eventually fries and so does the barn. And you're gonna to wanna to clean out all the cobwebs and the chaff that's in here. These are just lat what we call ladder fuel. In other words, a small spark somewhere near the ground can just climb right up these things or move right along extremely fast. Um, I also have a handout that we provided here, Protect Your Investment. It talks a little bit more about these things and what you can do. And how about the biosecurity? What has been the typical pathogen load in this facility? Have you been seeing a lot of E. coli or worse yet, salmonella Dublin? Can it be adequately cleaned and sanitized to reduce or eliminate the contamination? You know, you may have to power wash through 100 years of whitewash in order to get back to just bare wood. And even then, can it be made fit for very susceptible animals such as neonates? Uh, last thing we want to do is, is get these animals that are uh, very susceptible to any kind of disease floating around there exposed to them. We always used to say the firstest with the mostest. You know, is it going to be uh, the environment with all of its pathogens getting in there, or is it going to be, you know, clean bedding and colostrum? So do sweat the details, you know, draw and redraw, you know, plans, the profiles, the cross sections, and the elevations. Specifications, write them out exactly what you want. This is what we call the items of work. And actually, if you do a good job, it may actually lower the bid because the contractor knows exactly what he's getting into and he doesn't have to build in a buffer in there uh, to cover any of the uh, things that he may have to come in contact with. And run the copies to your key employees and other agri-service professionals that you uh, work with. Get their input, especially with the employees. It's the only way to have buy-in and ultimately success. And then change orders are expensive. And the more detailed you can be, the more you will minimize this and save money. Now, it's a livestock enterprise you're looking to put in there. You know, what are you looking for? You know, how many chickens, hogs, lambs, feeder finished cattle, et cetera, are you going to need to reach an economically critical mass? And then how much is required, you know, per animal or for this production enterprise? Is the building big enough? 
just whatever you do, remember to build for the animal because they're the ones that are going to be living in there. You're just going to be coming and going. You also can take on, put on or take off a sweatshirt or a jacket or whatever. They can't. They have what they have. And then any, any ancillary structures, you know, feed, waste, storage. What other things are you going to need or have to deal with in those situations? We talked a little bit about ventilation systems and the different options we have. Of course, are natural, where it's just the the natural breeze is blowing through and relying, we are relying on that. We can assist it power perhaps with some circulation fans or maybe some powered chimneys. And then there's mechanical, which can either be a positive pressure or pushing air into a building, negative pressure where we're trying to draw air out of a building or neutral pressure where we're actually pushing and pulling uh, at the same time. Whatever they are, they need to be specific in our use. So which one's going to work best for the situation? There is another handout there. It's a decision tree. And you can just follow it down and answer the questions and follow, you know, is this the situation? Yes or no? And then just follow the area, the arrows as to the next question. And eventually you'll get down to what is going to be my best option given the facility I have and what I want to do. So what are you looking for? Well, it's gonna vary by species and maturity. Obviously, a smaller, younger animal is not gonna have uh, the heat and moisture output than older, larger animal is going to. So the building requirements usually exceed the animal requirements. In other words, we're ventilating not only for the animal, but also for the building. We wanna shoot for that larger number. Some of the numbers we wanna shoot for is 40 to 60 air changes per hour during the hot weather of the summer. In other words, 40 to 60 times that air changes completely in that building. 20 to 30 times in mild weather and about four, maybe even six in the colder weather. And you don't wanna compromise these goals. It can be devastating to the animals. Now, too much air, you know, or drafts can chill the animals and a draft we figure is anything that's air that's moving at greater than 60 feet per minute especially during the cold weather and remember what counts is what's happening at the animal nose level you know you may feel quite a bit of breeze up where you are going across your face at five and a half six feet but the animal is down there below four feet so the thing to do is to drop down to your knees and see what the animals are experiencing now, some of the things for any livestock operation, regardless of size, is some sort of treatment chute, or at least a head gate, because it's gonna allow you to treat the animals safely, do any sorting, any spray-ons that you may have for flies, weighing, of course, so that you know how much to treat, because a lot of your um, treatments are based on milligrams per kilogram of body weight. You're gonna to wanna to tag them, you wanna, Preg check your brood animals, uh, receive the new ones that are coming in, and get ready to ship the ones going out. So the benefits of having this, of course, is safety. And here's the basic momentum formula of physics. So we're looking at the mass of two different things and the velocity of two different things. And after they collide, what the changes are. So if you figure 180 pound man, versus a 1200 pound bo bovine, you know, guess who, which one's the bug and which one's the windshield. So of course that's for the safety of the personnel, but also the animal as well. And hopefully it'll be reduced the cost and labor requirements. In other words, if you can get the animals in there, through there, get them restrained, when the vet is on site, it should be less cost for his visit. And again, it's gonna give you the ability to treat animals on site. So you're not gonna to have to transport them off site to get them treated, whether it's you know just to get some um, shots done or hooves, you know, a little bit of trimming on the hoof, whatever, you can do that right there. And again, you need to locate these uh, where you don't have to move cattle too far. You like to have them slightly uphill for drainage and for lying the cattle up. And for security, 
it should be one access road in. Otherwise, otherwise, access is less likely if there's no escape route and make or make visible from the public road. Uh, neighbors, you want to kind of keep the, the dust, the smell, the noise away from them. And again, leave room for expansion. And you also want to have something uh, close by, some table for supplies and for record keeping and spacing for spar the parking space uh, for the net vet truck and keep that close so they can get what they need out of the truck quickly and easily. And again, we wanna protect these from the elements. Uh, the people, the cattle, the equipment always works better in a clean, comfortable conditions and the equipment always lasts longer. We want to eliminate shadows because they tend to freak out cattle and keep the lighting as uniform as possible. Uh, and they will tend to move better, you know, keep it brighter towards the head gate because the animals tend to move better from a darker area into a lighter area. But it shouldn't be blinding light or it shouldn't be a very dark building. And you want to have sufficient headroom. Now, this is a uh, handling facility. It's kind of an elaborate one, obviously. And we try to duplicate some of that within these facilities. Now, one of the first things we'd like to have, of course, are scales. Again, they're nice to have. They can be rather expensive. And you want to place these ahead of the squeeze chute or head gate uh, to calculate treatments. Again, a lot of these treatments are on milligrams per kilogram. You like to have a, a sturdy, steady floor underneath these things. And it should be very serviceable. Coming out of there at some point, we like to have a foot bath. You know, it's for periodic treatment for digital dermatitis, foot rot, et cetera. You know, it needs to be about 12 feet long, two feet wide. This is so we get enough time, the feet actually entering into the solution. And then slope sides on it, one that it gives us a little more room around the barrel of the, of the larger animals, but it also means any splashing of the material is gonna drain back into the, the foot bath itself. The other thing you like to have too is a, a side gate on these things. That way, if the animal happens to go down into these foot baths, it's very easy to open up the gate and let them get out. And again, locate it for ease of clean out. It should have a good way, an easy way to drain out, either to a manure storage or some sort of holding tank so that it can be spread on the fields. And quite often you're using copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, or formaldehyde in these units. So I just want to finish up with some uh, exam real life examples. Here's an overhead of one in Allegheny County. Again, it's in a, a larger gambro roof barn. Uh, there's an addition here, single story addition, and several holding yards out here. Uh, it's big enough that he can actually back in anything as big as a uh, pot belly. He can unload them in here. These fences are sturdy. Uh, so these animals are probably gonna be a little freaked out after their trip, but they can get out in here, they can calm down, and then they can be brought in to be processed, or they can just be brought through and held in these holding pens until later. Inside, of course, we have um, our squeeze chute, a working chute, the crowding pen. There's a catwalk on the crowding pen so they can access the animals. And there's a table in there in order to keep all the, the vet supplies, the record books, whatever else they need and then several holding pens in there that allows them to sort animals going in or com coming in or going out. So just as, what do these look like? This is that um, main walkway through there with the pens going off down into the side. Uh, here is that large single story area where they can bring the animals in, just let them settle down a little bit before being funneled into the crowding pen, the working chute, and then up through to the squeeze chute. Squeeze chute, of course, has head gates on it. Um, 
and it is bolted to the floor. So even a big animal coming through, that's not gonna, it may rock a little bit, but it's not going anywhere. Again, the table to keep supplies handy. And then the gates are all set up to allow ant to direct animals either in or out of these pens. And just the pens have a, uh, basically they have uh, either dirt or uh, heavy sawdust in there. They have filled in all the gutters with concrete. So there is a, a uniform floor underneath these. They can be easily cleaned out, but also give a lot of traction comfort to the animals. This is a smaller one we completed on a farm uh, two years ago. Uh, these are just the designs for it. Fortunately, because of COVID, we haven't been able to get back there and take some as-built pictures. Uh, but it is a three-sided shed. Um, we have in one corner uh, a crowding tub and a uh, working chute. We've got a, a blocking here so that they can do the palpation and headlock. Uh, they also have it that if they wanted to, they could actually tilt this out a little bit more. That way they would have access to the squeeze chute on both sides. Again, just a really simple facility and uh, the animals are easily handled within it. Another one is a retrofit, uh, basically taking an old machine shed, uh, opened it up on one side, the south side, so that we have a concrete apron with a packed clay mound out there. Some people might call this a Wisconsin mound. And then over on the one side, we have the crowding pen going through the working chute, squeeze chute, and then either ship out, load to a truck, or return them back to the barn. Real simple. Uh, another one, very much along the same lines, but we've got an H-bunk in there and a bedded pack, so we can feed both sides of the H-bunk. And what we have also in here are some ad hoc box stalls. These are just some 12-foot gates hung on the wall. When not needed, the gates swing back flat against the wall, so you have the entire area available for the animals. But when they need them for treatment or calving or something like that, they can be swung out, and they have a very private area for the animals. You don't have, uh, you know, 40 other mothers with their face right there as you're trying to pull a calf. Again, with the crowding tub, squeeze chute, and then either return or shipping out, depending on what they're doing. Uh, this is another one here in Wyoming County, um, small beef operation, took an old dairy barn and reworked it so that it can have the, the chute and whatnot in there. Um, this is the head, it's where the animals come in and go down the chute. These are adjustable so they can adjust it for everything from small calves up to, they've got a 1500 pound bull they have to deal with that can barely fit through there, but he does. And the biggest thing that he said on this, the difficulty is on these adjustable ones is the corners. It just gets real tricky and the animals really kind of bang around in those corners a bit. They do have a scale right before the squeeze chute. And he said, that's one of the best investments they've made because now they know how to treat the animals and how much, and they have actually saved quite a bit of expense just because of treating the animals with the correct amount instead of over slightly overdosing just to make sure. And then along with the squeeze chute, they also got a palpation box. So now they can run the animals in, do all their preg checks and run them back out again. Works pretty slick. The animals come out and they can either return back to the barn or this gate swings all the way back. And there is another gate here that slides actually through the wall. This door slides open and they can back the truck right up to the wall, slide that gate out so it meets the truck and the animals can come right from the chute right on outside. Some of the other novel things they've done, this is an old dairy barn, like we said, and it was a head-to-head uh, stanchion barn. What they did is they actually filled in uh, quite a bit of the old uh, manger and put these built these brackets, bolted them in. This used to be stall here, and this is where they feed all the round bales. 
They've come up with a, a round bale, automatic round bale feeder. You can see it's on a slope. As the animals eat it, the round bale rolls forward. Really easy, uh, very little waste. So I realized that was pretty quick. We went through there a lot faster than I did in practice, but uh, just were there any questions? Um, yes, uh, thanks, Tim, for a, a lot of great information. We did have a person that uh, had a question about a, a specific uh, situation that they have. They have a large older pole barn that was built in the 1970s, and they are looking to retrofit it uh, both for hay storage and for some small ruminants. It currently has a wet dirt floor, and the person is wondering if you would recommend that we raise that floor with gravel or raise the floor and pour concrete or, or what to do with that. Uh, boy, the, if the wet floor does concern me. Um, and I think probably one of the things we need to deal with first is what is the drainage along the outside? Uh, quite often you have a large roof, which obviously doesn't hold the moisture. It all drains off and you, it drips down uh, right below the eaves. Uh, they may first need to install, uh, you can install gutters, which tend to be a real maintenance headache, or you can install a French drain, which is basically digging out a, a channel uh, Oh, a foot and a half wide to a foot and a half to two feet deep, uh, putting a perforated drain tile in the bottom of it and then backfilling it back to the surface with either some crushed stone or round number two stone. Uh, and then take that tile and outlet it someplace safe. Now, sight unseen, I can't tell you exactly where that is, but that's what we'll need to do first is to get rid of the exterior water. That's what's coming in, obviously. There's no rain inside, so the water must be coming in from outside. Uh, the other thing we can do is, like you mentioned, yes, bring in more gravel and raise the floor. Uh, where you're gonna be storing hay, if this is a gravel floor, you'll probably be okay. Where you have animals, you may wanna, that's where you may wanna put the concrete just because of the heavy traffic that's gonna be on there, more so than what would be under the uh, the hay storage. Okay, we had a comment that uh, the example that you were providing the uh, ag educator from that area believes that they had received a John May safety fund to help with some of the costs. Uh, so that is a, a great resource that's out there. And uh, that was put into uh, the link to that uh, uh, John May safety fund was put into the chat. Uh, so uh, please take a look at that. So I have a question for you, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning that you've come to Delaware County on multiple occasions to help uh, deal with uh, challenging situations. Do you have a statewide responsibility? And if a individual farmer wanted to, to get the, this resource or help from uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, how would they go about doing that? Would they contact their local uh, ag educator first and they would then contact you, Tim? That's the way it works best is to have them contact the local educator because I like to keep the, the local and regional educators in the loop on these things uh, because quite often they are my eyes and ears. Obviously, if I have statewide responsibilities, I can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, but also what that does too is if I have to travel a distance, it's helpful to have two or three stops uh, to make while I'm there, just in a, to make for an efficient use of time and they can kind of coordinate those. Um, so yeah, I would start with their local uh, ag educator or regional uh, specialist that they may be working with and then they can contact me and we'll see about setting something up. 